guys, welcome to the Chelsea Skidmore Show. I'm here today with my guest, Simon Rex. That's me. Actor, rapper. Yeah, Ractor. Uh, AKA Dirt yeah, Nasty. That's me. I'm a Ractor, rapper, actor. I'm a hacktor. I'm a hack. <laughs> I'm all the above. Thanks for coming yeah, out. Of course, of course. Um, you were just telling me. Wait, you're in a class at UCB right now? Oh, I just lost my hearing. You Can did? You plug me back. In? Oh, wait. I think it's a jiggly okay. thing. There it is. I got it. I got it. We got the um, ghetto stuff down here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I just, well, I just, okay, so randomly, I, like, I did a couple things at UCB, but not like the class a couple of times. Like, I went on a podcast there with uh, Doug Benson once yeah. where we we're talking about movies or something. So, I, and I've gone to watch them put stuff up, but my, uh, my girlfriend randomly went by herself to like the audit class or I guess the walk-in class and she went by herself last week because she's really funny. I'm like, you should do something while you're here in LA. So she went to the class and she said it was so much fun. So I went back with her last Friday and did this walk-in class with these really funny fuckers. It was like, like a pop-in? Yeah, exactly. It was like a three-hour workshop where you just do basic improv exercises mm-hmm. and uh, it was really fun. I hadn't done that in so long. Like, uh, you know, it's funny because I'm in there and they're like, aren't you the guy from Scary Movie? Like, what are you doing here? I'm like, you're, well, you're never, you never stop learning. It's not yeah. like I'm above going to class. You know, if anything, I should be going to class because you need to keep sharp. So I, I went in and it was so much fucking fun. Yeah. I'm going to go back. I think I'm going to sign up for like a longer workshop with them because I've done Groundlings. I did a group called Gotham City Improv in New York 20 years ago. So it's been a very long time since I've done any like class. And I forgot how much fun it was. It is It is a lot of fun. Yeah. I've done Groundlings in UCB as well. And um, What do you like better? Is it okay to say? Yeah. What I mean, I don't want to get I, you. I, you know, people are weird. Um, I think I might like Groundlings really? better. Um, They're different. But both, it's so funny. They're so supportive compared right. to stand-up. Like you walk in there and everyone's clapping yeah. after every single thing, right, right. which is kind of funny, but everyone's just so nice there. And then it's like you come here and everyone's just like an asshole. Yeah. Not really, but well, like. Well, that's one thing I learned because I tried stand-up too for a little bit. I just did it as an exercise to try to do it. And I didn't get a lot of support from other comics. If anything, it was like kind of like the same thing there it's like oh the, the fucking dirt nasty the guy from scary movie and mtv wants to tr- it's almost like they thought i was disrespecting the craft but i just wanted to do it for me because i figured if i could do stand-up i could do anything and that's pretty true once you get on stage and read your own material in front of people paying to laugh you can get do anything it makes auditions a lot easier so i just tried it for a while but i didn't feel a, a huge support from the the community of comics and i'm friends with a lot of you comics yeah. i come here all the time and just hang out but once i I was doing it, it was a different dynamic. Well, but yeah, it's more like an acting class at UCB or Groundlings where you have support. Yeah, it, and it's just more collaborative yeah, there. Yeah, Here, yeah. Um, it's every man for himself. Totally. It's, it's much more competitive. But I mean, I think everything is competitive in a way. You know, we're in, in the, the bowels industry. of the fucking beast right here. At the yeah. comic, this is it. Like it's crazy. I give you credit. I remember when you first moved out here, you just dove right in and moved and just started coming to the store. And I always thought you were really funny. The Thank you. I've yeah. known you forever. Yeah, I've known you before you were doing comedy, and I thought you were funny <laughs> when I was an we, alcoholic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you were much funnier then. That's was kidding. I? I'm just kidding. Um, no, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> uh, but I was thought you were funny, and so this makes sense. And I just thought, you know, I followed. Well, I. Followed Followed you on Instagram. I unfollowed you and everybody uh-huh. else, but don't take it personal. Okay, we that's we fine. could get into that later if you want. I just I had a <laughs> meltdown the other day in New York, and I unfollowed seven hundred people. So I followed. What was the zero. meltdown about? I don't follow my family. I don't follow my girl. I don't follow my friends. I just hit this wall of fucking. I couldn't take it anymore. Like the amount of time spent looking at dumb mm-hmm. shit on Instagram that isn't helping me as a person or helping me grow or. You know, psychologically, it's kind of fucked up when you just look at everyone's life all day. It's like a weird thing. So I'm like, if I was reading all this time, I probably would be smarter or better off. So I just unfollowed everyone in this crazy meltdown. I, and I love it. I open my phone. I'm like, what do I do? Yeah. I can't look at anything. Yeah. It's great. I, I've had to delete my apps. Like, I'll yeah. delete it for like four days and then I'll get it again. And I do that one too. It's always, well, do you get depressed sometimes when you see people that, um, you know, like your friends achieving things? Well, that's the that's yeah. the thing is it's every, we, you know, this this is like a known thing. Everyone knows this. It's like you're looking at everyone's highlight reel, you know, and you're watching everyone eat this amazing food or travel to this place or getting off of a private jet and you just feel lesser than. It just, yeah. This is weird thing Everyone. To you. Everybody. And it doesn't matter. Like, we're so blessed. We're living in LA. We're living the dream. And e- even we're looking at it like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> like, it's, it just sucks. So I just needed a break. I'm sure I'll follow you and my family and friends again. But um, my point being is that uh, I saw you jump right into it. 
and uh, yeah, proud of you. And we put you Thank on you. Typical Red. Yes, the show, I actually yeah. had Nick on here. Oh, good, good. Which one? Swartz or Goosen. Goosen? Good, good. Yeah. Yeah, right on. Um, who, who, no, for those out there, Nick Goosen directed Grandma's Boy. He directed Typical Rick, a Comedy Central show that me and Nick Swartzen did at Chelsea was a part of. And uh, a lot of other, you know, Chris D'Elia was on, Theo Vaughn. We had some good yeah. people on there. We yeah. pulled a lot of cards. Is that around when you met him, right? Be- Wait, Nick? Didn't, no, Theo, because you yeah, guys it was. became friends around then, exactly. right? Exactly. I came to this room and did a podcast with Theo a couple years ago, right when he went sober, and he was doing a podcast with a different gentleman whose name escapes me. And we, <laughs> I know it was someone else. I can't remember who it was. It wasn't Brandon Schaub or his new partner. It was someone else. And I, uh, I became friends with him. We just did a podcast yeah. like this and got to know each other. And you know how it works with podcasts like – your phones are off. You get in an in-depth talk for an hour and a half. There's no distractions. So I really kind of jumped in it with Theo, and we become close friends. And then, yeah, we, yeah, we had him on the show. He's doing so well right oh now, God, too. It's so it. awesome. It's... He's just – last night when I, w- I was here last night, and he got called up, and people were standing up out of their seats cheering for him. And you just see – I mean, he's a, he's a star, but he's also a big star on the rise, you know? Yeah. I always said if he was a stock, I'd invest in him. Like if you can <laughs> invest in uh-huh. actors or comedians, I'd be like, that's a stock that's going to be making yeah. money later. Because he's obviously like a good-looking, charming Southern dude, mm-hmm. and he's so funny and humble and nice, and his podcast is – I think his podcast is really working for him because he's really vulnerable. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you listened to it, but... Uh, I actually just listened to the one with Sebastian. Oh, but yeah, yeah I started to listen to that one. Um, I, I think Sebastian's probably one of my favorite oh comics, my God. if not he's my favorite. He's amazing. He's just fucking... Like, it doesn't matter what he says. It's just funny. Like, mm-hmm. he could talk about the scooter problem mm-hmm. in L.A. and make it hilarious. Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Theo's so vulnerable and honest and kind of like this... You know, just so sincere that I think he's using the podcast format to for his benefit really well. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, he, and he's getting on Rogan all the time. Right. He's just working with the big dogs and doing, like, the fighter and the kid. And he's just, like, killing it. So I'm yeah. just so proud of him. I'm just happy for him. Yeah, me too. Yeah. When did you, when and where did you do stand-up? It was. Uh, this was so long ago. I did stand-up in New York City in, like, 97. I did stand-up at, like, I'd go around, um... With Artie Fuqua, you know who that is? Yeah, I He's do. He's a good friend of mine. I was working at MTV at the time, and Jordan Rubin, a good friend of mine, was a comedian. I talked to Artie... him on Raya. Oh, good. Yeah, Jordan? Yeah. But it didn't oh. really go anywhere. Yeah, good. It shouldn't. He's a maniac. No, I'm just kidding. I love <laughs> He's you the guy. red-headed one, right? Yeah, uh, kind of, yeah. like Very red-headed, Ju- yeah, okay, yeah, ish. Reddish Jewish mm-hmm. man. Um, he would have murdered you. Um, he's, uh, no courtesy laughs. You have to laugh real. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, and he really got me to try stand-up. I was like, I want to try it. He's like, dude, just fucking do it. And I was really intimidated. Like, I remember the nerves, like, the day of, like, waking up in the morning and knowing I had to do stand-up that night. It was equivalent to, like, when you're in high school and you have to fight somebody and your nerves Mm -hmm. are, like, you're just so scared. That's what I related it to. It was fucking nerve-wracking. And I never did it enough to where the nerves went away. Because I go on the road and I do my dirt, nasty comedy show on the road all the time. And I perform it at comedy clubs and music venues. But it's, it's music... So I could hide behind if it ever goes weird or flat. I play a song and everyone knows the music. And in between, I do jokes and I incorporate the crowd and I do some fun comedy stuff. But it's, it's really not like just stand-up. Doing just stand-up and having to read your own material, make people laugh, that's... To Being me, on that, your own up oh there God, without any of, anything else to get, back you up. It doesn't get more like fucking gnarly than that to me. <laughs> So I tried it for a while. I probably did it 15 times back then. I did it like in New York. I did it in L.A. a couple times. I did it like once in Indiana. I remember once, I, I don't know, randomly I had a comedy club bring me out. And, uh, and then I didn't do it anymore because I'm like, okay, tried that. Didn't work, you know. And then I'd say about eight years ago, I kind of did a little L.A. circuit. I had to go to like the Ha Ha Cafe in the Valley or I would do open mics at um, this place on Coanga. I can't remember the name. And again, it was just really not I, I, you know what? It's kind of like surprised because I feel like you would be good at it. I just didn't do it enough, I think, and yeah. I, I wasn't really trying to become a comic. I just wanted to do it to do it. So I think I, I did that, and I kind of compare it to jujitsu. Like I took jujitsu for a while, and one day I was getting beat up, and I just was like, I, I'm not a fighter. Yeah. This is not what I do. I tried. Fuck it. It's just not me. And on to the next. But. At least um, you're the kind of person who can notice that because the yeah. worst are there's so many people who do comedy who just shouldn't be and right. you want to go up to them and just say just stop yeah just stop but I you know, can't isn't that you crazy? know you can't but you should be able to and 
the thing with comedy is I don't think it's learned. I think you're either funny or you're not. That's why, yeah. it's like, for you, I'm like, you're naturally funny. It's a rhythm. It's not something you can go to school and learn how to be funny. You either got it or you don't. And you can learn how to tweak it and mm-hmm. go to class and learn exercises, mm-hmm. but it's something you're born with. Mm-hmm. I really believe that. Mm-hmm. I don't think you can go to comedy school and learn how to be funny. Right. It's like you either, it's an instinct, mm-hmm. I think, personally. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, okay, so you started out working for, I, I want to hear kind of like the trajectory of like how um, you started to get into yeah. entertainment. Yeah, yeah, sure. I was, let's see, first I was, um, I was, I, I, I was working in New York City in like 95 as a model and I was out there in Europe and New York doing like really cheesy modeling shit, which I just wasn't thrilled with, but it was like, hey, I'm around girl models and getting paid to do nothing. This is fun. Uh, and then one day my modeling agent. Uh, Who were you with? I was with an agency called Boss Models. They were like this mm. big men's agency. And this is like Tommy Hilfiger days. Like I would do the Tommy Hilfiger Ooh, campaign wow. and Levi's like when Tommy Hilfiger was hot. And I remember one day there was a male model at our agency named Marcus Schenkenberg. Do you remember him? Dude, I made out with him Did in you? Miami. Re- shut the fuck up. Yeah. Okay, so you know who Marcus Schenkenberg is. But I'm not really. I oh. just saw him because he had been on some reality show. Right. What was it? Yeah, he was on a reality show. I was forget, it like, like celebrity, celebrity rehab exactly. or celebrity something? Celebrity something. And I just talked to him and I was like, you're Marcus Schenkenberg. And he was like, yeah. And then we like made out out in a club for like five minutes yeah. and then I left I, it was like me yeah, being yeah, yeah. wild and okay, crazy okay yeah that's you were, you were crazy <laughs> so that was a good story yeah no he, <laughs> he so he was like the supermodel he was like the yeah. male supermodel that kind of Zoolander was loosely based on like him is and that a couple, true it was like loosely based on him and a couple other models because at the time there had never been a male supermodel so they thought it was a funny thing to poke oh, fun of funny. so anyway I was I was doing that so he had to do an interview at MTV but he was so busy working he couldn't go to the rehearsal he was a guest on an MTV show so my agents being savvy were like oh let's send Simon to fill in for him because he'll be funny and maybe get a job out of it because you so, were a model with a personality yeah I guess that's what they thought I was funny and I was always you know just a silly dude so they sent me to fill in his shoes as the as the guest rehearsal so at the rehearsal I don't know if you remember who Kennedy was she was a big yeah DJ. I do the redhead curly hair yeah exactly so she and I just had this banter and we were fucking around and they, after the rehearsal, they go, hey, we're looking for talent. Why don't you send us a cassette of you? This is back in the, like, VHS yeah. <laughs> camcorder days, like a big VHS cassette. Like, why don't you send in a cassette of you announcing videos generically? And I never sent it in. Mm. Months went by. Why? Why'd they you never ca- send it because in? Because I just didn't think anything would happen. And then months later, they're, like, calling my friend's apartment. This is before cell phone. This is, like, 95, 96. And they're calling my friend's apartment, and finally one day they call me, like, where's that tape? I'm like, oh, I never made it. So, like, ten minutes I made a video with my friend, like, in his kitchen going, hey, this is Simon Rex, welcome to MTV, coming up, we got Metallica, Alanis Morissette, and I just... And they go, you got the job. Isn't that amazing? It was crazy. That you didn't even, do you, do you know how many people would be like dying to do that? And I you don't know. even care? Isn't that amazing how these things just like fall into people's laps? Well, that's the story of my life is that wow. it's very fortuitous, meaning that it wasn't by design. Like everything just happened by chance. So that fell into my lap and I was like, oh, okay. And I sent the thing in. I remember when they hired me, I was so dumb. I said, uh, well, I have no journalism experience, no music experience, and I've never done TV or anything. They go, perfect, you got the job. <laughs> no one else here has either. Right, exactly. There's a, that's what we want. I was like, oh, shit. So then I'm working for them and doing like I'm thrust into like spring break and all this shit. And I'm just like, what the fuck is this? Who were the other guys? Was that was, like Jesse Camp? It was before Jesse Camp. Okay. He was after me. He was the next round at like 98. I was there like 96 to 98, and he was the first uh, voted in VJ. That oh. people voted for, like the public decided. Spring um, break must have been fun. It was fun. I remember going to like Panama City Beach and like holding that microphone in your hand was like being God. You just had yeah. every. This is, but, but mind you, MTV at the time was there was no internet, there was no social media. It was the only place to go to for cool shit was MTV. Yeah, and I was the guy with the wow. microphone. Like it was my life just changed overnight, and all of a sudden I'm interviewing. You know, Howard Stern live at the movie premiere of his Dream. movie. I'm interviewing Jackie Chan and John Stewart and like the biggest names in every field from acting to music to whatever. I was just like in the middle of it. So I met everybody. Tupac. Interviewed Tupac live. <laughs> Why wasn't that first? 
What do you mean? It's the it's. I feel like it's like the fun. Oh yeah, I forgot because I was just kind of thinking like, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. What no, you got name to, good people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and interview Tupac, and I was one of the last people to interview him before he passed away. Actually, wow. it's crazy. But yeah, I was just thrown into that. I interviewed Madonna. Like it was fucking nuts. I just met and everybody. Were you were you nervous to do it? Did you feel yeah, like you um, were unqualified? Like, did you have a lot of negative voices around yeah, you? Yeah, I that? did. I, my own voices because it was like you said mm-hmm. earlier. It was like supportive around me, mm-hmm. and everyone was cool around me at MTV. Um, but you're like, but my I don't own know what voice, the fuck I'm, like, I'm what doing. What the fuck am I doing? And I remember just having to like be on live television and interview people, and it was the most nerve wracking thing. But after a year. You get used to it. Yeah. So after, you know, even sooner than that, after a few months, I got used to it. And I was just like, this is just normal now. So I really got comfortable with just being myself Mm -hmm. in front of the camera, just fucking around. And then Gus Van Sant called MTV one day, who's a big movie director who did Goodwill Hunting and did like Drugstore Cowboy, all these big movies. So he calls MTV and he's like, I want to read Simon for a movie. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah. So I went into an audition with him and Matt Damon for Goodwill Hunting. And I remember oh I was God. sitting in a room just like this, and it was Matt Damon and him, and he gave me the lines, and I started to audition, and he stopped me, and he's like, Simon, that was the worst audition I've ever seen. And I go, yeah, dude, I've never done this before. He's like, no, no, it's okay. You're not ready for this. And, like, Matt Damon's, like, looking at the ground, like, laughing at me. It was so bad. Was he anyone then? I forgot. Yeah, he was a big actor. He was, oh, big, he was. He was blowing. He was already had acted. Okay. But he was, that was, like, his big break probably. But he had worked before, and he could tell I was green, and I wasn't ready for that movie. Yeah. So I did a horrible audition, and he said, I'm going to send you to an acting coach because you have something. You're just not ready. Huh. So that I went to this like serious acting class in New York with like theater actors. Where was that? It was on like 44th and 10th I mean, in the theater uh, district in New York. Do you know the name? Uh, yeah, it was Anthony Abeson was the name of the teacher. And I did that in Gotham City Improv. I just tried. I was like, fuck it. I got to maybe I'll get work out of this. So again, fortuitous, just not by design. I got lucky. It was like right place, right time. So then all of a sudden I'm taking acting classes because I'm like, oh shit, I could probably parlay this MTV thing into acting, you know? So sure enough, after the MTV gig came to a halt, like they fired everyone one day, including me. So I'm just sitting around New York, had some crazy shit happen. My friend committed suicide in my apartment. Oh my God. Yep, it was heavy. Shit got dark real quick. Not to make this all crazy, no, but I'm just telling wait, the truth. No, wait, what? Yeah, a friend jumped out of my window. Oh my God. Yeah, it was heavy. Was he your roommate? No, he was a friend of mine. I just let him house sit for me while I was working. And that, it was like so heavy. So I was like, all of a sudden that and another friend died very shortly after. I'm like, I got to get out of New York because it's getting dark. Like it just, the party was over. So I went to LA, leaving all that shit behind me with like 5,000 bucks in my pocket, like ex MTV VJ, no idea what's going to happen. I bought like a used Cadillac and I just moved to LA and I started auditioning and just started booking everything because I just didn't give a fuck or know what I was yeah. doing. Ugh. And they were like, oh, that's a guy from MTV. You know how it works. Like, yeah. you know, they knew who I you was. You had a little something. Yeah. So it was like I had a little clout from that. So next thing you know, I'm just booking like, you know, Scary Movie 3, um, WB holding deals where they put me on like Felicity and Jack and Jill and did what I learn, like about you. Did you learn to act from that school? Yeah. Or do you, that's why so I started So it taught you the... It, it gave you like a found. Was it like Meisner or something? Yeah, or? it was. It was like Stanislavski method, okay. which is like theater acting and mm-hmm. you know like serious shit. But it, honestly, like I didn't really. I just kind of began to learn, and I don't. I still don't really consider myself like an actor. Like I'm a dude who did a few fucking jobs that kind of got lucky. You've done a bunch of shit. I've done a bunch of shit, but I just like anytime I'd hang out with actors, I never felt like one of them. I felt more like a comedian, like even hanging out with the comics, as much as I wasn't really embraced, I felt more like one of those weirdos Uh than I did an actor. Like actors Mm. always kind of just rubbed me the wrong way. I was never just like, I don't know. Like they're too serious and boring Yeah, they take themselves too seriously. And that's the difference between like comedians are willing to laugh and make laugh at themselves. But actors just kind of take themselves so fucking serious. I was just annoyed. So like I I I, never really fit in, but I worked. So I was just like, okay, cool. Um, and then, were you surprised when you started booking things all yeah, of a sudden because of what had just happened in the past uh, with Gus? Yeah, I was, and it was it kind of all happened. Looking back, it was pretty quick. I mean, it, at the time, it felt slow, but looking back, it was like, oh, a year later, I was doing a movie and a TV That's show. That's insane. And all this. I know it was really like again, like I'm not going to say. I don't want to just sit here and be like, I was lucky because, you know, luck is what operation meets like time uh, plus luck. Preparation meets opportunity or something. You know what I mean? So it was a lot of right place, right time for sure. 
And uh, when the window was there, I jumped through it and took advantage of it. But I was never like at any point, like, I want to be a VJ. I want to be an actor. Like, it fell into my what lap. What did you originally want to do? Just model? I don't know. I, not, you were I didn't tall want to do that. that. That fell into my lap, too. I never <laughs> wanted to be a model. I was just, I dated this girl who was a model. You're so crazy. I just, not no, you, but your you. life. Yeah, it's no, amazing. It's, dude, I, I love stories sick. like this. It's, it, it's, it nev- never once in my life was like, I want to be a model, I want to be an actor. And we could even get into the rapping thing, too, because I mean, that fell into course. my lap. So, <laughs> so I know this is a lot going on at once. This just will tell you the whole story. And then, so, and then I'm working as an actor, but even as a working actor, you have tons of downtime. Mm-hmm. There's so much time. Let's just say you work six months a year as an actor is a lot. You have six months. Yeah. To, what are you doing in six months? So I started making beats for fun. Like I, Adrian Brody, dropping names. Mm-hmm. I'll drop name on you. Adrian H- Brody was my hotty. friend. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he taught me how to make beats on a little keyboard. He was a friend of mine. This is like before the pianist. He was like, uh, you know, one of my boys from New York. And we would make beats and sit around my little guest house in the hills in Hollywood and make beats. And he taught me how to do it. So I really ran with it. And I was like, oh, I like this. This is fun. So I'm making beats as a producer. And I met Mickey Avalon and Andre Legacy, these guys I formed Mm -hmm. a group with. And we did a song called My Dick, 1980, kind of like, you know, these sort of comedic rap songs that I did for fun. Those are like. Cult songs. They become cult songs, absolutely. And my dick just went platinum. It's so crazy. What? Yeah, it just went platinum like a few months ago. I just Congrats. got the plaque from my manager. It's so fucking weird because I made the song in five minutes. It was me and my boys fucking around in my spare bedroom. And it's a song about my dick. Like, yeah, exactly. It's, it's just so, so silly. Bop. It's so dumb. Yeah. But that's what people want to hear. And again, it was just like right place, right time. I was just fucking around with my friends making music, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers heard it, and they're like, will you open up for us on tour? What? So the next thing you know, I'm in Europe with the Red Hot Chili Peppers opening up for Wu-Tang Clan and the Chili Peppers in stadiums with 80,000 people. We're like, what the fuck <laughs> is going on? And this is like a movie. It's like, like a, movie, a yeah. Truman Show kind It's of crazy. Thing. I can't even believe it myself. I look back and it's like all this shit happened, you know, within a 10 year period. So, you know, this is like by this point, it's like oh five, oh six, And the Chili Peppers are having us come on tour with them. And we were the first MySpace re- artists on MySpace oh, yeah. records mm-hmm. where they, they were like the first social media platform. And uh, so then all of a sudden I'm touring the world as a rapper and my acting agents are like, what are you doing, Simon? Yeah. Like, where are you? Why can't you go to this audition? I'm like, I'm in Poland with the Chili Peppers. Did like, they think that was going to uh, affect your image as an actor? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like I had your a brand? publicist who did, yes. I had and, a pu- yeah, and they were so right. It did. I want to know what happened with all of that and okay. like... And it's like, you know, it, you're setting out to do what you want to do. This is such a big thing that a lot of people don't yeah. realize. And it's like, stop trying to box me and like yeah. let me live and be who I am. Well, that's exactly what I said. I'm like, look, I don't know what's going on, but when the Chili Peppers ask you to go on tour, you fucking do it. You're not going to yeah. say, no, I'm an actor. Like, what the f- I'm fucking not an actor. I'm just an entertainer, you know? So then I go on the road with the Chili Peppers, and we have this newfound thing where we're touring all over the fucking world, um, you know, DJ AM and Travis Barker are scratching and, and drumming with us live. Like, it became this whole thing. Did you know how to be a quote-unquote rapper? Like, I want to know if you were sitting at home watching YouTube videos before your first show, watching how other people move around on stage and be like, okay, like, do you know what I mean? I think I was did just... Did you kind of teach yourself, or did you just naturally just go up there and be like, fuck it? Well, I think I was just a fan enough of music or rap music and a fan enough of watching TV and film to be like, oh, that's what I got to do? Like, I'm an only child, and I grew up just watching TV and listening to music my whole life and watching MTV as a kid that when it presented itself I'm like oh I can do that I've fucking been watching this my whole life like I've been listening to rap my whole life I've been you know watching MTV and watching movies like I could emulate that I, it's not like it's some fucking I'm not splitting atoms mm-hmm. or you know but you're not a person who like comes from a place of fear you're like fuck it yeah exactly and I think that was what worked for me was that I didn't give a fuck and I just went for it and I think that really works for you and you know in your 20s you really genuinely don't give yeah. a fuck and you don't really think about your actions or, you're, you know, you just kind of do it. And I just went with the flow and shit just happened, you know. And so now here I am 20 years later because MTV was 20 fucking years ago, more. And now here I am and uh, I still tour and do the music stuff. I still do film and television. I don't do stand-up, but I'll do like hosting gigs. Uh-huh. And again, like when I do my music stuff, I'll do those things. So, my whole life has just been this random chaos theory fucking like, do you want to do this? Okay, do it. Like, I don't, I'm 44 years old and I don't know what I'm going to do next. And you I look love ageless. It. Ah, thank you. <laughs> I did the right drugs. Um, 
Uh, Downers? I, yeah, probably. Yeah, more smoking weed. And I was never You're big You're just drinker. resting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just slept and rested. Um, I didn't do the uppers. I'm naturally up. Um, so my life has just been this constant, like, improv class where it's like, you just say yes to everything, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes, and, you know what I mean? Like, the number one rule in improv, yes, liar, and. Liar, liar. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah, five, he yeah, goes, I'm just going to say yes. Isn't that? Oh, you know, that, that movie. Oh, no, there's a movie called The Yes Man or something. Was oh, it was that? Line? Actually, that's oh, yeah, my, yeah. what it was, but yeah, still yeah, Jim yeah, yeah, Carrey, exa- right? Exactly. And... Uh, do you, so, do you, did you actually kind of live that way? Like, I'm just going to say yes to things? I or? think I just did. I didn't think about it. It, was not a, it wasn't not any plan of attack. It was really just like... That sounds fun. Yeah, I just fucking was like, fuck it. Like, yeah, why, why, why would I say no to any of those things, you know? So I just had a very blessed... Um, <laughs> all these opportunities that I just went for and had, you know, moderate success at them. And, you know, I still am lucky enough to get to do those things for a living and how long how many years have you been going on tour now uh it's a, it's a little over 10 years i guess that was in like oh six that started so 12 years now and every year every year we get offered to do like a you know a u.s tour an australia tour sometimes canada um not too it's weird because our music is very comedic so it's mm-hmm. in english it's understood but it doesn't translate in europe or asia oh really so because the jokes don't translate it's very yeah, like that makes sense you know so english-speaking countries australia america UK, um, Canada, we tour, but we're not really getting booked in Rio de Janeiro, you know? Right. Uh, which is fine. I mean, that'd be cool, but like, you know, I think we did your, a couple, yeah. Where's your biggest fan base? Canada, Australia, and US. Uh-huh. Mostly like West Coast and the South. Like once we start getting to like New Orleans and kind of Atlanta, the fans thin out a bit, like dramatically, like instead of 600 people at a show, it's like 300. I can understand that though because yeah. they probably are more into like hardcore rap. Yeah, or more conservative or more like Southern rap. Like uh-huh. our shit's very gimmicky, kind of like tongue in cheek, silly yeah, rap. Get- but like it does well in like New Jersey, New York, Boston, like yeah. we do well up there. So it's just ran- – I don't even fucking know. To be honest, like I had no idea how any of this happened. I'm just going with the flow. You kind of just see where the wind takes you, and it's mm-hmm. worked out this far. So I don't know what's next. I'm thinking about maybe being in the NBA, but I might be <laughs> too, too old and Jewish. I know I'm getting old when I was like watching a game the other day, and one of the coaches is 38 years old, and I'm 44. I'm like, what the fuck? 30, uh- I'm older than a coach. Yeah. The fuck in my mind, I'm still watching. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm like them. Yeah. I'm 25. Like, no, I'm not. I'm 44. How old? Fuck. All sports, I don't know anything about sports. They're all, what, under like 40, 30, right? Yeah. Uh, well, dep- like baseball players will get a little yeah, older. Yeah, yeah. Like they could be in their mid 30s, but usually 30 are peaking. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. In most sports. Uh, or, yeah, even they call the NFL not for long because the average oh, career funny. is three years. Wow. Yeah, it's fucked but up. But they make a ton of money. They do, but then they're only average three years. What's like the is the general demographic like college age? Would you say? Yeah, for sure. For our music, yeah, yeah very immature young crowd. You know, you know, I was a fan of your music before I met you. Right. Oh, what songs like uh, My Dick and? Like, uh, yeah, like 1980, right. uh, Cracker Ass, Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I remember being in college, like loving that, and like I, I remember I went to like similar shows, and it was just so much fun. But everyone there is like it's very young, fun, very yeah. hyper. You know, I watch you on the road um, on your social media and your shows get crazy. Yeah, They're o- they it's always a big party. That's a lot of energy. It's that. And it's and girls imagine, are. Yeah. It's still young and rowdy and crazy. And now as you get older, you have to pick your battle. So imagine you go on the road for like five days in a row and you're like Chicago, Detroit, Indiana, did it. And you're looking at the schedule like, okay, well I can't drink every one of those nights. I'm going to have to pick my battles. I'll just drink in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And the other ones I'm going to drink apple juice in a Jack Daniels bottle on stage and pretend I'm drinking because I can't you be can't do it no, anymore. You can't, you can't. Once you when you get older, when I right? was younger, it was cute and you could. But now I, I I'll go. I'll do the whole tour sober. Sometimes I did a whole month run really? sober. What was that like? It's f- actually fun, man, because you're really kind of taking it in and you're there and present and you're not just like fucked up. It's just annoying to be around 500 drunk people sober. It's just like going to a bar. Yeah. sober. it's the worst. Like being around drunk right. people sober is so fucking annoying that you have to drink often to be able to deal with the rowdiness. Yeah. So I have to put on this whole act where I'm pretend I'm fucked up. Because I know. People want to see that. They That's come the to char- see me. It's the character. Doing, exactly. It's a char- I created a monster. Yeah. Dirt Nasty's <laughs> like a monster that I created that. Lyric. Pays the bill, you know what I mean? I yeah. know that's Eminem. 
<laughs> oh yeah. Wait, what lyric was that? From? I created a monster. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I created a monster. <laughs> no, I really did create a monster. And it's funny because my biggest song is I'm on cocaine. Yeah. I don't like cocaine. I've done it before, but it's not my favorite drug of choice. So the fucked up thing is everyone comes to my show and throws bags of coke at me. Is that true? Oh, all the time. Throws and blunts and, on stage. Yeah, yeah. And I'm that's not my party, you know? And so it's like kind of funny that people have this misconception that that's really who I am. And then they meet yeah. me. They're like, oh, you're like a normal, nice dude. I'm like, yeah, dude, it's a fucking carrot. It's a joke. Yeah. But people don't know how to separate the two. Um, and also, you got to imagine, like, when we go to these little towns, like, these people have been waiting for me and Mickey to come all year. Yeah. They think they're going to party with us. So we got to, like, run out the back door and, like, uh-huh. fucking... Because we kind of... That's inter- every show, right? Pretty much. Because I remember rowdy, yeah. just going to a couple of years in New York, you know? It's... Yeah, every single... There's always, like, the hoes yep. hanging around, you know? Which is fun. And Which is cool. fun, but I... So I noticed in particular one recently, I think it was, like... It, it looked to me like um, some kind of, like, in the middle of nowhere kind of town right. that was a huge fucking party. Right. And these chicks were, like... Uh, like, like, pra- like naked or, or something, yeah, or like, and naked. I'm like, do you hire these dancers or do they show up together with their friends dressed up in like fishnet? Do you know what? I can't remember exactly. It was something recently. And did I they have like dirt nasty titties on? That or might have been yeah, it. I think that was Boston. There's some diehard okay. fans that come out with like you know and these I'll, crazy strippers show up that yeah. like you know know everything, and then we like they they just bring all their friends. So it's a real party and it's a lot of fun. But again, like you have to like. Does that get old? It does get old. Well, Absolutely. Oh, getting older. Do you know getting what I mean? Older, when you're young, old. it's like fun, but like, and especially is it like fuck? Like, I don't feel like doing no, like this is cool it's a job. and it's great. It's a job. It's a job, and it's a lucky job. And if, I'm not if trying I to be a fucking, dick by saying no, no, that. No, you're absolutely right, and that's and 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 that's what it's come to. It's like we go on the road, and you know, it's so much energy. It sounds crazy to say this, but like so much energy. It takes so much energy to deal with all that rowdy energy. Well, it energy. looks like it. And then you can imagine coming home, like imagine after a night, like I remember reading Steve Martin's autobiography and him saying he'd be on, and I really relate to comics because I'm on the road in these random towns. You give yeah. all your energy. Everyone's looking at you. You give it all and you come back to your hotel and then you've got to try to go to sleep. But, but you can't. You going. can't come down. That's what Steve Martin talked about. He's like, I'd be going back to my hotel room and you're tired as fuck, but you're just staring at the ceiling because yeah. of the energy you just had had with everybody it takes yeah, a lot and it's so odd it's i don't know why that, that is most but it, people won't understand that thing it's yeah a, you understand it because you come home and you're buzzing you know? we can't yeah we can't go to sleep no it's we're just up talking up until and we're up until four in the morning it's and then d- your sleep schedule every day and then imagine then the next day you got to drive six hours to the next town and do it again and like Ugh. fuck you know and everyone's trying to give you shots and party and you're just like dude no and you have to say no a thousand times and they don't understand it's like yeah that's my job so if that's my job <laughs> Like and I now you're say, peer pressured by a fucking you know eighteen I mean? year old. <laughs> but now, but nowadays with this whole like Me Too thing and how crazy uh-huh. the world is, like it's better that now, like I understand the reality of it. I don't fuck you. Don't party with your fans. You Has don't that affected? Of uh, or it just gets no. in your head a little. Well, no, you just got to be extra careful. Like you can't. Like there was a time where you might be able to after the show go drinking with your fans. Nowadays, fuck that. Like you really gotta be extra careful. Did you have to have a conversation with like uh? Like the people you perform with and you know hang out with, and you're like, dude, we can't even do that. Yeah, anymore. I don't. It wasn't like we had to have a conversation. We all just agreed that that's sort of how it is. Especially as we got older, we didn't want to. But there was, you know, a time in the beginning where we would be partying with our fans afterwards and having a bunch of chicks in the room, and can't do that shit anymore. No way. All wow. they gotta do is say, oh, he did. You know, you're I know. Fucked. So. Thank God that that is all under the bridge and in the past. But even now, you sit around thinking, like, damn, some chick could just say that and six years ago. Like, you don't fucking know. Yeah. You know? It's just crazy. It's yeah. just, like, a weird time. So How- it's a scary thing. Like, you just got to be extra careful and, like, not, you know, interact too much with your fans. But that's the thing. We do meet and greets. We hang with our fans. I bring my fans on stage mm-hmm. as part of the act. Yeah. So you just got to be cognizant of it, you know? Um, how do you get yourself energized for, like, a full night? Um, coffee and Red Bull usually helps, you know, like, if you're fucking fatigued. But the adrenaline kicks in. Like, as you know, like, mm-hmm. you'll go out on stage and it just kicks in. Totally. And, like, I always say, like, the hour on stage is, that's the easy part. It's the fucking drive there. The sound check with the weirdos coming around before. The people trying to get in the hotel after. Like, that's the work. 
Yeah. On stage, it's fine and it's easy. It's just everything around it. Yeah. You got people trying to, like, I mean, it gets fucking rowdy still. And, it, I, and, and as an older guy now, you're just, I have no energy for mm-hmm. that at all, you know? Yeah. I know that you, like, lucked into a lot of cool opportunities mm-hmm. early on with rapping, but did you have to do, like, how did you build your fan base? Well, again, it was like we got pretty lucky in that it was MySpace had just come out yeah. when we started in like 05. And that was sort of the vehicle we used was MySpace. And everyone like you probably found it back then in college, MySpace, and everyone shared it and it circulated around. So we were just really fortunate that the technology at the time like let us, you know, share the music got shared so much. You know, back the, the, in, in like 05, that's how it spread. Everybody was sharing it online. So it just kind of went, I guess, not, I don't know if it went viral, but that's how it sort of spread around and everyone was sharing. Like, oh, have you heard these guys rapping about my dick and cocaine? Like, it just hadn't really been done. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. now there's a bunch of white rappers talking about drugs. I'm not saying like, oh, we were the pioneers, but like we, no one had really done that except the Beastie Boys and they were, you know, like that we kind of took their mold, Mm -hmm. like crazy white dudes talking shit. But you also like had a unique sort of thing that no one else really did, you know? Which is Like in terms of just like funny comedy, but like fun, like party. I don't know. Like, I don't think that there is really another person that I know um, who's done that and, like, made it work to the effect that well, you Well, Little Dicky, he's big right now. Little Dicky's a rapper who I came know out. there's all but these Lils, but right, I don't... Right, right. He's, he's really big. He's, like, uh, he, I think he has, like, his own show and Adult Swim coming out, and he's, like, he's like the next generation of kind of what okay. we did, and he came up to me at, at a party, a Christmas party. He's like, dude, if it wasn't for... Dirt nasty and my dick. There would be no little dicky. Thank you. Like you put. So I think it's just sort of the next. Wow. Like we kind of paved the road for mm-hmm. like people. Oh, we can. Oh, so you could get up there and talk about your dick and be a white rapper. Yeah. Like that, you know what I mean. So it was just sort of like again, it just happened. There was no plan. Like we always say, if we went back and like strategized it, we wouldn't know what the fuck we were doing. I saw the same thing. I'm not comparing us to them, but I saw. Uh, Black Sabbath documentary and Ozzy Osbourne and Black Sabbath, they created heavy metal without knowing what they were doing. And they're just fucking around, wasted in England, making music. They turned the album in and their label was like, they put it out and the world went nuts. And they're like, what the fuck is this? And their label said, okay, do it again. And they all looked at each other like, we don't know what we did. We were just fucking around. Like, wait, now we have to go do what? what, what? And that's what we went through. So they call it like the sophomore jinx. Like your next huh. album, you're never going to be able to duplicate what you did before you had success because now you're in your head like, wait, we got to do this like this. We were just fucking around. And that's why the best shit when it first comes out is so raw. And like you listen to like the Violent Femmes album and it's like sounds like it was recorded in a garage and it's perfect. Mm-hmm. Or you listen to like... You know, and then as quite often in rap and most musicians, as it gets more, it gets worse. Mm -hmm. Like when you go to a Rolling Stone show or Mm -hmm. if you've been one, you're not saying, hey, play your new song. Never. I don't want to hear most of most of the new songs of artists that I love. I don't want to fucking hear. And they're not that good. That's what I'm saying. I went to a Radiohead show and they're playing all this new shit. I'm like, I wanted to walk out. I love Mm -hmm. Radiohead. I wanted to hear the fucking old shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of how it is for us. We go on the road and we're at least So you stay with that mentality? Yeah, we just give them the old shit and we're like not trying to listen to our new like just give them yeah. all that shit that's what they want to hear yeah and it just fucking happened like that's why people are like you have any advice like I'm like no <laughs> like I don't have any advice because I don't know what happened like we were just we were just like okay I always reference this too uh, Charles Bukowski has on his grave two words don't try Ooh. and I know what he means at first it's so you're hard like, to not you know well, okay so we I'm could talk of, about yeah. this uh, I, sorry I'm going a mile a minute I have my coffee today I'm trying to catch up. Yeah, don't try. I know what he means. He means like, okay, for instance, when a guy, let's say say a guy's hitting on you and he's trying too hard. As a human being, your reaction right there, uh, you go into an audition and you over try, you're not going to get the job. When you just do it, that's when people are attracted to you. When you're not trying, when you try too hard, it's a turn off. So I know what he means. So we didn't try. We just did it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then in the last couple of years, my manager's like, hey, you got to put out some new music. And it's forcing it. And it's not mm. feeling good. So I don't put anything out because I'd rather put out nothing than something like where I'm trying too hard. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind of like your motto just kind of works you know with I mean? you. It's yeah. a weird thing. It's a weird thing. So I You just, want it to just happen, hanging out with your friends. We dude, make a song. Cool. We got a new song. We'll, you know. That's how it has to happen. And there's a book about it called Trying Not to Try. 
And it is a whole thing. I was tripping on it. Do you recommend it. it? Yeah, I do recommend it. It's called Trying Not to Try. And the, it, there's a Chinese philosophy about it called the Uwe. And the Uwe means don't try. Same thing. And the Uwe is like when you're in a flow state and you're just doing it. And like you see comics when they're in the zone. I'm sure you've been on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're not thinking and it's just happening and you're reacting and it's place just to killing. Be. The, the zone. You're in the zone. Sometimes you get up there one night and you're trying too hard and it's not happening. You're like, fuck, you're in your head. <laughs> yeah. It sucks. So and the audience doesn't like feeling like they you need them to. Yeah. You know what I mean. And yeah. some nights Everyone the magic is in the air. It. You know what I mean. Like the other night, I actually came here, and it was a weird night. Like the drapes were closed, and like the is it the other room or the main. main the main room? So the drapes were closed, and every comic came out and addressed how awkward the vibe was in the room. And it's the second time I've been in that room, and that's happened where even like like it happens Sebastian, a lot here. Sebastian was like, "Oh, is that the night he bombed?" He didn't bomb. I heard about that. Oh, though. I didn't see him bomb. He, he didn't bomb, but he he, thought, addre- he was like, I just came from a fucking like empathy. It's funny. People come from like arenas. Right. He and did. Then he had just done four nights in a row at Madison Square Garden. That was it. Okay. I heard yeah. And I Neil Brennan. I already heard, see, it, I so he heard about no, he that. He didn't bomb. It was just the whole crowd was whack all night. And and he addressed it. He's like, "Did you guys all just come off one bus together? Like, what's going on here?" <laughs> right. And it was I was dying. Yeah. But the crowd just wasn't even understanding who he was. They weren't even getting it's... it. And it was just one of those nights. You know what I mean? And uh, I wouldn't say he bombed, but it was just obviously like coming off four nights at the garden. You'd be like, you know, it's something. crazy. Does that happen for you? Yeah, like, there's with off audiences nights. And, yeah, there's and you're off just trying nights. to do your thing at the party, going. You're like, are you not? So do you? You probably don't call it out, do you? Sometimes I'll, you know, it's a weird thing. You don't want to because then yeah. it changes the energy in the room Then everyone's aware of it. So it's a weird mm. thing. You got to be careful. Sometimes you just got to push through. You know, sometimes between songs I'll be like, come on, guys, wake up. You know, we could. And then, like, I'll, I'll trick them and be like, that's it, man. We're getting there. Oh. I feel the energy getting picked Ooh, up. And then you see them kind of, it's like the same thing. There's this weird psychology thing where if you go to a party and nobody's dancing, that first person to go out and dance, it doesn't get everyone on the dance floor. It's like the second or third person that comes out. Out, that's when everyone else comes out. So human beings are followers and sheep. So in a room full of people, if no one's laughing, then everyone's not going to laugh because they're like, "Oh, what? I shouldn't be laughing." It's so, so it's a weird. weird. It's, a it's weird so weird. Thing. Uh, you know, or one section will like say there's three sections. One section will be all laughing, and then a whole other section. It's so odd. I see people cover their mouths sometimes, and I'm like, "No, let it out. Like you can laugh." Do you think it's L.A. has a weird? Because cr- obviously we're in the best place for comedy in the world. I think obviously one of them is, is the comedy store. But like sometimes you'll be in the crowd and you're like, oh, everyone here is like a tourist. No one's fr- no one's really. It's LA is a t- touristy mm-hmm. kind of town. How many locals are really in the crowd compared to tourists? a lot of foreign people That's too? Yeah, foreigners who might not understand the references. Yeah, like, but sometimes I don't I don't know what it is. But something that I'm always like trying not to do, like every once in a while, like I'll like if something doesn't work, I'll be like, oh, okay, and it's like I'm like burning. I'm like I cannot fucking do that. Yeah, and call out when it. You know what I mean? So do you do you find that when you're doing stand up, do you do you ever do crowd work? I haven't yeah. seen. I really haven't seen you do stand up to be honest. I yeah, think I can, years like a few yeah. years back I came and you did something here but it was like a you're doing like an all girls night or something oh, you were just started yeah, yeah. The worst. no you were just <laughs> I, I hate just, to say that I just no, did yeah. one of them but yeah uh, yeah no so I'm sure you've gotten a lot better since then obviously. I have and and do you do crowd work do yeah do, I yeah. do crowd work I like to stick to jokes because right. I like uh right. you know I have like a certain set that I want to do right. and um but um uh, of course uh, I love doing crowd work right. but I don't do strictly I mix it up Right, because some comics just do crowd work. Some yeah, don't you know do who Rick Ingram is? Have you seen him? What's his name? Rick Ingram. Yes, he's fucking hilarious. Yeah, I saw him the other night. I think he was during. Is he like half Asian, half white? No, no. Okay, he's a, a guy. white guy who's like is almost he... like someone who would be in a Mike Judge like show. Yeah, he's got kind of stringy hair, and he makes fun of the crowd the whole time. No? no, I don't know about stringy hair, okay. but yeah, he makes fun of the crowd the Black whole time. Black woman, is that him? <laughs> um, no, I okay. I'm, I, I see so many comics lately. I can't place the face. Well, but whatever. Anyway, he's yeah, a great yeah. crowd work guy. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. when you um, go out and uh, perform, do do you ever get nervous anymore? Or I, you know, I feel soulless because I <laughs> don't. Like there could be. I've just done so much shit. Like I remember the last time I got nervous on stage. I really remember it clearly. I don't know if you remember if about seven years ago when Charlie Sheen went on that tour. When he went the Tiger Blood the, tour, the winning well, yeah, tour. Yeah, wait, what was that tour again? It, it was called the um, there was something the Torpedo Bomb of Truth tour. Or yeah, something. what was he doing though? He I forgot. He snapped and lost it and said fuck everything, and I think he had just been fired from Two and a Half Men. And he goes, you know what? I want to go on a nationwide tour. And he brought Kirk Fox 
and me. Is that what he did? He yeah, brought, he Kirk. brought Kirk. That's Kirk so funny. Fox you know, I had me. such a crazy night at his place one time. Kirk Fox? No. Oh, Charlie Sheen. Yeah. Really? I'll so tell you about it later. Okay, because I've known him for crazy. 15 years, and I've never had a party night with them. Oh, he I, was. Oh, I guess I can say he was. I'm not going to say too many details, but he was deep in it. Yeah. Partying really hard. Oh, yeah, I went to go it. pick up my girlfriend from uh-huh. this place who had been there for like 48 hours yeah, or something. Yeah, sounds about right. And But you know what? He was so fucked up out of his mind, but he was one of the funniest people I've ever met. He's a total sweetheart. And I couldn't believe how funny he was. He's a funny fucking guy. And he's so, so eye contact, quick. sincere. Yeah. Great dude. Like totally down to earth too for a huge celebrity. Like he doesn't act like a big... Totally. You know, but so he calls me up one day and he's like, hey, Simon... Uh, I'm going to do a nationwide tour and I want you to perform 1980 at the end of it. And of course, I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll come. And I was in Salt Lake City about to do a show and he's like, cancel the show. I'm flying you back to LA. We're going to go online live right now and announce it. So I canceled my Even show. Even though, but you know how he was in like a manic, crazy kind of thing? Yeah. Like, were you like, fuck it, it's Charlie Sheen, let's do something fun and different? Or were you like, uh, I don't know how this is going to play? I was a little nervous that I didn't know how it was going to play and it ended up being a disaster. But I was, <laughs> I, I figured if I'm going to, if my boy's going to go down in flames, I'll go down with him and why not have this experience? And yeah. like, I just did it to do it because it was something different to try, you know? So I went on tour with him and Kirk Fox. What was he doing? He basically didn't know, he said he has no plan. He's just going to go on stage. He's like, sign I mean, here's the thing. My whole life, I've been told, stand here, say this, and wear this. Fuck everything. I'm doing what I want to do. I don't care if I bomb. I'm like, all right. So we go on tour, and first night in Detroit, he's bombing out there. He's just talking to the crowd. He doesn't know what he's doing. and Like in a manic state kind of Yeah, thing, he's right? out there just like doesn't know what to do, and it was so hard to watch. I'm on the side of the stage, and the whole crowd is going, refund, refund, and they start walking out. Kirk Fox bombs really fun he's like everyone give it up for dirt nasty and i come out and i start rapping this is the home of detroit uh, eminem i come out rapping as a white rapper and i never forget the crowd is like an exodus of people leaving and they stop mid like l- exit and look at me and start fuck you flipping me off and i just had to push through and i'm like dude this is a disaster right so uh, uh, this is going to answer your question the last time i was nervous so we're going through these shows and they're bombing. The whole country's talking about how bad it is. And I go, dude, you need like a comedian to come on board to save this besides Kirk doing a five minute set. So I go, let's get Jeff Ross to roast you. And he's like, who's Jeff Ross? And I go, trust me. We call Jeff Ross. I know Jeff for years. He comes on the tour and saves the fucking thing from sinking. Huh. All of a sudden, it becomes a roast of Charlie Sheen. Yeah. And he comes out in a bomb suit. So when Charlie's bombing, Jeff Ross comes out in like a bomb outfit, and he's like, Charlie, you're bombing out here, buddy. And he starts making fun of him, which led to the Charlie Sheen roast on oh. Comedy Central. So I was the, I made that fucking happen. It's like, so one thing, like, I, it's so crazy. Like, if I didn't call Jeff Ross, there would have never been a Charlie Sheen roast on Comedy Central, which is their biggest one. Was so, it? Yeah. yeah it was the biggest one of all time. So I was the one that, like, like was the middleman for all that it just happened that way and i remember when i hired uh jeff ross when i called him i was like oh i just lost a job because he's gonna come take over the whole show which is fucking great i just wanted the show to be better so i never forget we're in new york city and i'm about to go out at uh what's it called um um rockefeller plot what's the famous place in rockefeller center i can't remember the name of the place it's like the most f- prestigious 40 pla- Ro- yeah 30, 30 but it's like Ro- at 30 rockefeller center whatever it is it's like the place radio the, city radio musical? city music hall so i'm about to walk out on stage in front of a packed house at radio city music hall of press and everything that's crazy and i remember i'm standing behind the curtain and i'm nervous as fuck Fuck. Yeah. Because I got to go out and I, they're ready to fucking see us die out there. And at this point in the tour, I'm interviewing Charlie on stage. I just sit with him and ask him questions. So I would remember my heart beating out of my chest. And that was the last time I could remember being nervous backstage. Oh. Was that. And that was because I'm like, I don't even know what's going to happen. Yeah. And this is like the whole world waiting for Charlie to fuck up. Uh-huh. So that was the last time I could remember being that was a very long-winded answer. But that was the last time I could remember being nervous. Now, I, I don't give a fuck anymore. You know what yeah. I mean? I'm just, like, does, I don't feel anything. I'd be way more nervous to do stand-up, for sure. Uh-huh. But going out there and doing the songs that everyone knows, that they're drunk, like, uh, it's like fucking easy. Do you, you know? ever, you said that you don't, you feel like you're not really an actor. Do you ever get nervous when you're on set acting with other people? No, more on the audition. Like if I'm on set and I got the job, I'm usually Dude, fine. auditioning, do you still think auditioning is the worst? It's the worst. Right? It's the fucking worst. And like, it just sucks so bad because, you know. It's such an odd, like, it's yeah. It's the worst. It's like, and there's so many elements that go into it. Like what I remember, I, 
Actually, that's so yeah. I, I do get nervous when like, stories. like, or you have to go to like a chemistry read. I remember when I did uh, Scary Movie Five, like five years ago. It was with you know Anna Ferris didn't do it anymore, so I had to go to a chemistry read with the girl that they hired to be the new lead in Scary Movie. So I had to go and sit in front or stand in front of all these network heads, studio heads. Sorry, not network. It was like you know fucking. Yeah, Weinstein's and shit, uh-huh. and stand in front of them and do a chemistry read, and it like there's nothing you could do. You either have chemistry or you don't. So you better just hope that you and this actor have a spark. Who or is something. that with? Um, I can't remember her name. Okay. What's her? She's a Disney actress. I can't believe I can't remember her fucking name. The hot one. Vanessa? She's like a blonde. No, not her. She was in that same movie, the uh, High School Musical. She's the blonde girl. And I wasn't can't, that Hannah Montana? No, a different one. There's like another Disney girl like her that was the um, lead. I in feel this. good that I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I feel bad that I don't know. <laughs> um, I've worked with her every day for four months. Anyway, uh, I smoked a lot of weed in my life. My memory's uh-huh. shot. Um, and anyway, so like that, I remember being, you get nervous for that when you're on your fourth callback and they're like, well, let's see if you have chemistry with somebody. And you're like, I better hope I do. <laughs> you're grabbing her hand and shit. Yeah, like, <laughs> like forcing chemistry. Uh, so yeah, that's like, that's really the only shit that gets me nervous. Once you're on set, you're in there. You know what I mean? Like, I, I mean, I guess you could get fired if you really fuck up, but once you're on set with an actor in the environment, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm here. I'm yeah. Good. It's, it's a more totally like when different the stakes thing. are high. Yeah. Yeah. I heard uh, Anna Ferris recently on a podcast saying um, when she was working on Scary Movie, I think the first one, Keenan was the director of that, yeah. right? Yeah. That it, he said that she, she said that she was like watching Shannon Elizabeth like being all hot. Uh-huh. And he like whispers in her ear, like, there's no vanity in comedy. Yeah. And I love that. That's it's so just true. something I heard last week and I've just been reminding myself of that because. You know what I mean? Like to, you know, like if people are like, oh, you're hot. And then you're like, I just want to be like silly and have fun. But then it's like you need to like shed that sort of thing. Did you have to do anything like that? Yeah. Co- well, coming you, from being a model. Yeah. I mean, it's different as a guy for sure. It is, I think. Huh? And I'm not being sexist. It's just the way the world works. And like I've always been a class clown and silly. And I never thought of myself as a, but for, for like a pretty woman, it's mm-hmm. way different. And that's why you'll have success because you're a pretty girl who's funny. And I, I just being honest, like I think that's really rare. Yeah. Like Madeline Kahn was my favorite growing up. She was an actress who did like, you know, like uh, look her up. She's She was yeah. like a very, the name sounds familiar. very funny, attractive woman. Lucille oh, is Ball. she the one who uh, did all the? Uh, was she in Clue doing yes, facial expressions? Yes, I believe she. That was guy in Mike Clu- Schmidt in there just showed me that video the other day. Oh, she, I think she was in Clue. She was in a bunch of movies like History of the World Part One and physically she played, comp. She's fun. Yeah. fucking amazing. Okay, uh-huh. she was in all the Mel Brooks movies. She's like the shit. I think she was in like Young Frankenstein. Um, anyway. She was, as a kid, I remember watching, I'm like, oh my God, she's funny and pretty. It's pretty mm-hmm. fucking rare. Anna mm-hmm. Ferris, pretty and yeah, funny. Yeah, she's you, so fucking funny. She's, oh my she, God. She's fearless. She doesn't have, her brain, she's like, you gotta be willing to take the pie in the face. And I think what happens in society is that pretty girls are brought up to be a certain way and not look silly and hold themselves a certain way. So if you could strip that completely yeah. and be a silly goose yeah. and be attractive. Yeah. Like my girlfriend that you just met, people are like, oh, she's so pretty. Yeah. She's the funniest fucking girl Nobody realizes until they meet her. They just see pictures like, oh, she's so pretty. I'm like, no, she's funny. And yeah. that's why I'm with her. I, there's a lot of pretty girls. I need to laugh all day. Yeah. You, you know get what? tired of looking at a pretty face after a while. I'm trying like, to I'm tired work. of looking at yours. <laughs> like, it's disgusting. Thanks. Yeah. Well, yeah, like I'm trying, like I was like such like a silly person growing up and I too was class clown in the yearbook. Right. I always have to make the point to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and like, you know, no one like thought I was like hot or anything. So I, I was just free right. to like do me. And then when I turned like 15 and like went through puberty and like got boobs and like right. looked prettier, then everyone started treating me different. Right. And that's when like the simple life came out and I just like got all influenced by Paratel and right. I was like oh I just want to be hot Do you know right. and I want to be like dumb and then I feel like that totally like fucked up like yeah. the way that I would present Trippy. myself yeah 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 and then like my friends would be like I miss the old Chelsea and then like and I've had to like constantly work to like shed that like interesting other people's perception trying to be you know what I mean yeah, it's yeah, been yeah. such a process for me I'll to get bet. rid of I'll bet yeah that's crazy I didn't think about that I think a lot that happens a lot with now the Kardashians like young girls are watching that thinking that's what they need to yeah. be when really stupid yeah when really it's like I think if if you're willing to take the pie on the face mm-hmm. and make fun of yourself and laugh at yourself, mm-hmm. you'll win all day long because mm-hmm. it's like the Eminem philosophy in 8 Mile when he wins the battle rap at the end. He says to the guy, I am Trailer Park. I do live with my mom. I so after you do that, what can the guy say about you? Yeah. So it's the same thing like if you fucking are willing to clown yourself and be the butt of the joke – 
you win all day long. And that's yeah. what I don't think most people get that. Mm. And most girls that come to L.A. are more fixated on being a, an attractive, hot movie star than being funny. And um, it seems like there's like a renaissance right now of girl comics that are fucking that are funny and killing it right now. Like SNL for a while now has had funnier girls than guys, in my opinion. And you know what I mean? Like there's kind of like, uh, I'm not saying they're like smoke show models, but uh-huh. I feel like more than ever now there's like, pretty funny girls out there. Yeah, I think than... Vine helped with that kind of thing yeah, too. Yeah, those yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. girls who make those like funny yes. videos who are hot too. Yeah, and that's another interesting thing is who can make the transition from Vine or Instagram to like long form comedy, you know, to yeah. television or film. You know, I don't, I haven't Has seen anyone? Too, I haven't really seen anyone really like make a big leap. Like it's weird. I know mm-hmm. a lot of those, uh, you know, I was right. really into Vine for when it first came out. I was super active on there and I met and worked with a lot of those Viners. And like I still work with some of them. Like uh, Hannah Stocking is a friend of mine and uh-huh. she's like one of the biggest YouTubers on the planet. And like we did a couple YouTube videos and she gets millions of hits within a day. It's like, whoa. Yeah, millions of followers, all that crazy shit, and she's like a very attractive, funny girl, yeah. and she's super smart too. She's like a physics major and all that shit. So she's used the new. The, the, I'm watching these people, the Vine generation, are making a ton of money and making people laugh and doing their comedy without the Hollywood infrastructure. They're doing it on YouTube and Instagram and their fucking phone, and. I know, like, it's weird because it's so, it's not really like they're doing big Hollywood movies, but they're doing fucking comedy and making millions yeah, of Yeah, they're homes. so popular they in won. that one area, but like, then just crossing over to being in. Yeah. Yeah, the other. It's weird. You used to have to get hand picked. Like, I remember when I was working out here in LA, like, it was a few casting directors and they would pick you. There was no, mm. like, putting yourself out on the fucking internet and mm-hmm. having the, the masses pick you. So there was only a few people that could make you. Yeah. Now anyone could kind mm-hmm. of make it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I also, it, yeah. What were you going to say? No, I was also going to say, I think stand-up comedy is bigger than it has been in a long time. Yeah. I feel like there's yeah. like this thing happening where by default, because everyone's so desensitized looking at their phone all day and screens that they want uh, it live in like, and, and there's, you guys kind of have a community um, where you guys share podcasts with each other uh-huh. and have each other on and like you know Joe Rogan will have all his boys on and promote their stand up special and everyone's kind of it's like very egalitarian everyone's sharing yeah um, which is cool to see you know mm-hmm. I don't think it was like that in the 80s like there was like enemies and mm. do you know what I mean like it, it just still feels, is like that yeah, to I'm a sure, degree internally. but You're the, the inside, podcasting yeah. but yeah I would say that like Rogan when he has you on his it, it, Rogan's podcast is like the new Carson. It's fucking crazy. When he has you on, you get like three hundred thousand followers. You it's know, unreal. everyone starts. It's a whole. It's like that's the. It's so crazy how that's just how what he's done. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's helped out a lot of people. He's helping out all his boys, mm-hmm. or even like I remember he like when he had Theo on for the first time. Theo yeah. me up. He's like, I don't even know him that well. Like uh-huh. this is crazy. Uh-huh. Like he's this is gonna help me a lot, and it really helped him. Like yeah. he just got his it's numbers crazy. way the fuck up. Yeah. You know. How'd you um, meet your uh, chick? Uh, we met um, in Bali. Really? Yeah, I was in Bali. She was in Bali. We had mutual friends. Nate. She knew Nate. Oh my god! Yeah. I forgot about yeah, him. Nate, he um, knows all the hot chicks. Yeah, he knows. Do you all still the hot talk chicks. to him? I still talk to him all the time. I have What's his golf going on with him? He's, he's snowboarding right now in Utah. You know, he's a snowboarder. Yeah. Uh, I think he went sober. Oh, that, um, that's so funny. Yeah, I know Nate. So that's how we met. Is my friend Nate, and so he knew her. And oh yeah. yeah I so we ended up. I was in Bali, and I saw her on Instagram. I'm like, hey, I'm here. And then we just ended up hanging out, and and. We've been at each other's hip ever since. Where does she live? She you said she's in, long distance. She's living with me right now, but she lives in London and Canada. So oh, she's, is she foreign? No, she's from Canada, which is oh. the best. Like Canadians, to me, are my favorite people. They're the nicest humans on the planet. They're clean. They're clean. Yeah, they're, they're just, you know what it is? Have you been to Canada? Yeah, uh, but when I was much younger. They're just, there's something weird that's going on up there. First of all, there's a lot of funny Canadians, like from Jim Carrey to fucking go down the line, Norm MacDonald. To, I mean, there's so many funny Canadians. Um, uh, she has that, like there's some mm. sense, it's almost like British or Australian humor. Yeah, They have sort of dry. this quick wit, dry. And uh, so she's from like Montreal area and... She's just fucking funny, man. So, like, we just laugh all day long. And I'm like, at the end of the day, you want to be with someone that's going to be nice and make you laugh. Mm, There's a lot mm -hmm. of pretty girls out there, but you want to be with somebody that's going to, like, 
get you through the day with some laughter. You know yeah. what I mean? For me, at least. I'm sure it's like that with you and your man. Like, you guys seem to laugh all day and do yeah. silly little videos. Yeah. And, dude, that's what it's all about. You know what I mean? Like, you just need a partner in crime. Yeah. You need, like, a road dog that you can fucking talk shit with on the road and have fun with. And Yeah. How does it affect your relationship with you going on the road? With, like, okay, so, for example, like, me watching. I And just coming from a girl's perspective, like, I'm sure in your past relationships, there's been, like, probably a lot of insecurity, a lot of fights. Yeah. Uh, tr- trust. Yeah. Is in the she- past, it's been a nightmare. And yeah. with her, it's been so far it's really smooth. Wow. She never questions me or sweats me. It's Whoa. very refreshing. I've never had that before. Like, she really is And so- that makes it almost like... And, okay. I was going to say that makes it almost like you wouldn't do it. But yeah. I, I'm not saying that you're going. I'm not right. saying that you're the kind no, of person no, no. who would do anything. No, I, there was a but time in my al- life where I would have, but nowadays I but don't. But it probably... Like when that. someone's cool, it probably makes things like... Why would I fuck? Exactly. You know what I mean? But it's, when she's annoying, it almost causes like a... Do you know what I that's, mean? That happened I'm in imagining. the past. I had, I had girlfriends in the past that would be sweating my everything. What are you doing after the show? Hit me as soon as you get up. Like, fuck that shit. My chick now, she doesn't even care. She's like, have fun. Da, da. Wow. Like, she just doesn't Confident. even care. She, she doesn't... Exactly. And it makes you at ease about it. I actually went to Burning Man for the first time this uh. year by myself. I didn't bring what? my... I went alone. What? What? I know. we could. I mean, I don't want to go into a Burning Man rant because it's so annoying unless well, you've what been. What was your mind... What? was why I, now um well i bought an rv i oh, bought cool. an rv like a like a mini rv um like six months ago so i'm sitting in my rv one day and i'm like fuck i i should take this to burning man by myself but why by yourself well i asked my girl to go actually and she had to go to a wedding so i was like fuck it you know what i want to go check this out alone so i'm not with a group of people and i met my friends up there so i would hang out with different groups of friends but i went solo in my rv by myself for a week Phones don't work, nothing. For a week, you have no phone, nothing. And I remember after a week in there, I remember any girlfriend I would have ever had in the past would be like, you're fucking other girls. With. Like all my other friends I was with, their girlfriends were sweating them the whole time. My chick literally didn't even question anything. And like... Oh I could have like, I could have cheated, I could have done all this shit, but yeah. I, like, I did first of all, like everyone's all dirty and dusty and on drugs. Like you you think it's like about everyone hooking up. It's so not like that. And I remember thinking the whole time I'm there, like, dude, like I know if my girl was at Burning Man for a week with her phone off, I, my mind would be going Me crazy. Me too. Like just human being shit. Like, you'd be like, what the fuck are they doing? Why is their phone off? And I came out of it and she was just so cool, like, oh my God, did you have fun? Like, what was it? I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> I've never had a girl that cool before. I've never heard of any cool I, I, that, girl that, that Cana- cool. I think it's a Canadian thing. Whoa. And also just good parenting. Like she just comes from like this little mountain town. Her dad's a construction worker. Like she's just a cool chick. Like she's just low maintenance. Wow. And don't take this offense because you're an American girl, but my <laughs> theory is this. American women give the men nothing and expect everything. I'm not saying that's you. In my experience, the women okay. I've been with, they, they expect all this stuff, but they kind of give. And with her... She doesn't give me any grief and she doesn't expect it's so easy. It's just the most low maintenance relationship I've ever been in. And it's just so refreshing and nice to have like no drama. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, Do you guys so fight fu- about anything? We've gotten in a couple little things, but it's been like then we laugh about it. We're like, whoa, is this our first almost fight? Like yeah. we're not even yelling. We're just like talking about it. So there's been a couple things. Like, if anything, I've been on the side of more being like the weirdos, like, what do you Well, what you're do, not used to it. So you cause exactly and people who are comfortable in chaos and then you want to like it doesn't feel natural. It's just like letting go of all that shit's just so nice to not because what's the fucking point? Like yeah. you could sweat about it all you want, but at the end of the day, if someone's gonna do something they're gonna do it and it ain't meant to be whatever but like what's the point of worrying about it you know yeah i had to get used to that like in my relationship i had only been in bad relationships used to fighting and asshole guys and like this guy so you guys don't do that no No, drama or minimal drama very minimal hardly ever um and like it was so uncomfortable to sit in like such a good relationship that i had to like tell myself to just like fall into it. That's exactly where I'm at. Exactly where I'm at right now. It's like I'm not you I'm feel like I'm It's in like weird, a trust fall. Yeah, it's so weird. Yeah. I'm exactly going through that and I'm like, "Oh my god, like this it could have been this easy the whole time." I think I attract the crazy a little bit and yeah. I like that. Part of me likes a crazy fucking chick, you know, that's mm-hmm. going to fucking be, you know, just crazy. Like you yeah. want that passion. 
And as you get older, you don't want that exactly. Shit. It's just like want I'm it done. To be, I'm yeah, done. Yeah, like, I did all the crazy just... shit. I still got like the fucking on my the roof of my Prius. I still have the dent marks from my ex girlfriend <laughs> from five years ago jumping up and down on my car, stealing my iPad. Did that? Bit, yeah. What? Oh yeah, yeah. So I still like every time I get in my car with my new beautiful Canadian sweet funny girl, and I and I look at the dents on my roof. I'm reminded of what it's like to have a psycho fucking wow. shit, and how nice it is to have a low maintenance. Easy. I mean, she's probably blowing someone right now, <laughs> but. It's it's okay, you know? It's Mini okay. Mini golf. Yeah, exactly. exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's what they call it. No, I'm just That's kidding. That's fucking funny. But even like that was cool. Like when I saw her, you know, you, you came in the car with her and then she split. But I was like, I was like, oh, you can like sit in on it. She's yeah. like, now I'm good. Yeah. It's like, yeah, oh. She doesn't give a fuck about like she and and. She genuinely didn't know about Dirt Nasty, which was a big thing. I remember Ooh, thinking, like, I love that. the first time I had to take her to a show, I was like, oh, this is going to be a total deal breaker. Were you like, she I did... don't believe you that what she you didn't? Mean? No, I, I totally didn't believe her. And then later, she'd sincerely be like, oh, wait, that song, My Dick? Like, oh, that's like, she did, just didn't put it together. Like, she kind of yeah. knew, but she just wasn't like her thing. And she certainly wasn't like with me because of Dirt Nasty. If anything, that works against me. I'm like embarrassed about it, <laughs> you know? So like, it's not something you, you, you want your girl's mom to look up, you know yeah. what I mean? So like... I remember the first time she came to a show, I was like, oh, God, she's going to run for the hills. And she's like, oh, my God, I get it now. This is really funny. Like, it's a joke. Like, you're having fun. I'm like, yes, thank you. Supportive. Because I've had other chicks be like, the fuck are you talking about this? And it's like, oh, really? God, it's a joke. You know what I mean? I'm putting my and, feet up. That's fine. Okay. And they just, like, don't get it. Like, would they try to, like, make you feel small? Like, yeah, or just stop, me f- Just stop doing things with the girls. And you're like, but yeah. that's part of the whole thing. It's an image. It's a... You know what I mean? Like, and I always tell people, like, you don't have to like our music. Just come to the show because you're going to have a fun time. Like, it's a fun night. Like, I don't even like our music. Yeah. I just think you could, uh, I tell people it's a fun vibe. Just come get loose and have a good time. And that's what our shows really are. So I could imagine how a girlfriend would be worried about that environment. But, you know, you you build trust. It's a trippy thing. Like, you know, I'm I'm so used to the insecurity and the fighting that it's just nice to not have that shit. Jeez. Are you still doing uh, the three loco stuff? Yeah, you know, we just did a pilot for TBS. Oh, so we're awesome. Yeah, with uh, Todd Phillips produced oh, cool, it. Oh, cool, cool. I know Hangover him. Old School. You yeah. know Todd. He's the man, and he's a big fan of mine. He's always been really supportive, and he he like put my song in the Hangover, and he put, yeah. he put me in Project X, and he's always hooking me up. So when he heard I was doing the show, he's like, I'll produce it. I'm like, really? You don't do television? He's like, I do now. And he came and sat yeah. down with me in TBS, and he's like, I'm producing this now. And put his name on it as And producer. that helps. Oh, uh, you think? <laughs> Fucking A, it helps. So right now we're sort of in limbo, like, like yeah. waiting to see what happens with this pilot. But uh, yeah, it's Riff But you Rap, shot Andy. it and everything? Yeah, we already shot it. Um, What's it about? It's about half an hour. About just kidding. Um, <laughs> it's about... <laughs> worst joke ever. It's, just, it's actually kind of based on reality. It's based on um, me, Riff Raff, and Andy having been in a rap group and having success and then breaking up because money, drugs, and women tore us apart. So we all go our own separate ways. And five years later... We all went our own separate ways and we get back together. It's like the band gets back together because we get an offer for this big job. And I've become a yoga teacher. Andy's become a, um, uh, like a tech guru and Riff Raff's become sort of this mysterious, like weird dude. And yeah. we all are brought back together for this one show and magic happens and we get the band back together. Ooh, yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's loosely fine. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you just did a YouTube uh, movie? Oh, uh, yeah, I did a, a movie, movie yeah, exactly, in the yeah. theaters. Tell right, me about right, right. That. Yeah, I did a movie called Bodied, um, B O D I E D, like you got bodied, son. Like, What's rap, that mean? Bodied means like you got killed. Mm. So it means if you got bodied, like you got fucked up, like in a rap battle, you got bodied. So the movie's sort of the follow, not the follow up, but it's kind of like an eight mile. It's about battle rap. Eminem produced it. Joseph Kahn directed it. It's got like Anthony Michael Hall in it, who's one of my heroes. I got to work with him. Um, and it's about this nerdy white guy who who decides to become a battle rapper and it's filled with these tough urban motherfuckers and he goes in as this nerdy white guy and becomes sort of the funny nerdy white rapper and has a lot of success and it just follows his journey into the battle rap culture. Yeah. And I play this sort of this, uh, you know, funny, charismatic uh, host who hosts the rap battles that's based on this guy named Lush One who's a real battle rap guy. And, uh, and the movie came out great. I went and saw the premiere or a screening of it and it was like fucking good. When does it come so out? So often, I think it comes out November second or third. It comes out in, in theaters. In times for Oscar. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, you know, honestly, I swear though, I don't. It's like maybe not Oscar level, but it's getting like 
You know, awesome you know when you see a movie and it's got like, you know, Cannes Film Festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, it's getting all those acknowledgements. Oh. 90% on Rotten Tomato. Like every big movie fucking reviews giving it great reviews. So it, it came out really good. Wow. So I got a little, f- I, I sort of just have the comedic role in this movie. Like I kind of have this, I kind of, I, to be honest, like I steal the show. Like I get the biggest laugh in the movie, yeah. which is awesome. Um, so it's cool just to be like. You know the get the big laugh in the movie. Yeah, um, it's not a big role, but it's like I definitely, you made a meal st- out of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's no small roles, right? And then I got a movie too. I just played um, with Steve Renazizi. I did oh. a movie. I think I was we were hitting you up from set or something. I, oh my god, I remember that. Was like a year, that. A year and change ago. That's and so we funny. We were in Louisiana. Yeah, and I think I was like your name came up. I'm like I've known Chelsea forever. We like texted you. Yeah. So that movie's still being edited. What the, was that again? It's, it's called Avengers of Justice, and okay. it's a comedy about. Um, superheroes and oh, I play the fun. Joker he plays right. yeah. yeah I had the green hair he plays that um, looked good yeah yeah and he plays like a Batman character and Amy Smart plays his wife and uh, it's fucking uh, like it's like a kids movie it's for children it's literally yeah. like rated G there's no <laughs> bad words and um, so I'm not sure when that's coming out but I got to play the Joker which is really fun that's fun yeah when you did the um, body did you tell them that you had experience in that scene oh yeah they knew because the director is a battle rap nerdy fan too I don't mean that in a bad way he's a battle rap, yeah. rap fan I'm, so, I'm a battle rap nerdy fan too in that I've followed battle rap over the years so I Hollow. I know yeah exactly you know <laughs> he's, he's gonna be in town this weekend oh so, really and you've been to that's those battle so rap funny. events well, you know I haven't. Yeah, it's so snow crazy buddy, snow buddy. you know that's how is that, that name was created yeah, because I I, you know how you like hang on one side and I was the only white person on stage and everyone started shouting snow bunny I snow remember. bunny you went to a big URL event that's crazy like you went into the fucking belly of the beast like that's some real shit so you know you get it those are they're so funny it's a trip right? and I did one too yeah, I, I did one downtown that's and amazing. I won that's amazing Hollow helped me that's come so up dope. with some of my that's stuff that's so dope you should have him on the podcast because he's, he's still the biggest battle rapper he's in Florida now right yeah he lives in Florida but he's still revered as like the king still yeah so He's uh, and he's the nicest guy. Yeah. Um, and did he love that you did that? Oh, movie? He, well, we went and sat in the premiere okay. together. So imagine me, him, mm-hmm. and my girlfriend, and my girlfriend slept through the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> she slept at the premiere. I'm like, wake up! And she's like, huh? I'm like, this is so insulting. The director's <laughs> right there. She's like, I don't care. And she just slept through. Dude, the whole movie. she's even cooler. I now. know, That's right? <laughs> so she uh, slept through the premiere. Me and Holla watch it, and then uh, so. Uh, I forget what we're talking about, but yes, you. So you've been in the battle rap world. You get it. It's like a full on serious world yeah. with like millions of views, and it's like a whole culture. So since I knew about it, it was easy for me to portray mm-hmm. the guy. That, you know. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. Um. Well. What else? I don't know. I feel like I've just been talking about myself. Right no. Now. You You did a good job. Okay. What else? Anything else we should touch on? I mean, let's see. Um. Crazy stories on the road. Oh God, I got so many. I could I could give you one kind of crazy one right now that just happened. So I went. <clears throat> what I'll do sometimes is I take my RV on the road. Like for instance, if I have three shows in Northern California in Sa- San Francisco, Sacramento, and Lake Tahoe, I will take my RV because I love taking my RV out and I go by myself in the RV. It's where I'm at in my life. I'm a f- I'm a weird old retired <laughs> man at 44, literally, literally living in a fucking RV on the road. And I love it. Did you trick it out? Yeah, I put a music studio in it. I did a little paint job on it. I got like a Tempur-Pedic bed in the back. Nice. Fucking amazing. Um, so I took it up to, it was a heat wave like a couple months ago. Like it was really hot here in California. There's the fires up north. So I'm up north in the fire zone, heat wave, and my AC breaks. So I pull over to this little fucking town in the middle of nowhere up in northern California. It's like something out of a movie, like a, where a murder fucking horror movie would start, right? So I go to this little town. And my AC's out, so I'm fucking driving down the highway with my windows down, pouring water on myself. It's fucking 100 degrees. So I'm like, I got to fix my AC. I pull in this town, and I go to this like, uh, fucking auto store. And the guy recognizes me, the mechanic. He's like, can I get a picture with you? So I take a picture, and he tries to help me with my AC. And I guess in the time that we took a picture, he had posted it on Instagram or something. And all these people in this little town found out I was there. And I, in this little town, it's like Tom Cruise to them. Because yeah. I'm like in scary movie that right. to them that's the biggest thing that's ever happened in this little town. So I'm just being cool and taking a picture. My AC's broken. I'm chilling, and this fucking crazy like biker gang finds out that I'm there, <laughs> and they come out and they're like, "You're the dude from the scary movie Dirt Nasty." I'm like, "Yeah." They like, come here. You're getting a tattoo, and they try to bring me to this tattoo shop. And I'm like, no, I'm cool. I don't want a tattoo. I'm just trying to get out of town. I got to keep moving. They're like, no, fuck that. You're getting a tattoo. And they're like drunk bikers with like tattoos on their oh, face, shit. leather vest, like 
Real shit. What did they want you to get? The, I don't know. But they <laughs> wanted me to hang with them and get a tattoo and be like, you know. And so I physically had to like pull myself off of this drunk biker grabbing me by the arm to go into his tattoo parlor. And it was like insulting to them because I didn't want to get one. But I was like, I got to go, guys. Yeah. Like, please. And they're like, no, nah, fuck that. You getting one. Oh, you, oh, you're too good for us? The kind of shit. And I was like, oh, my I God. I didn't know bikers forced people to get tattoos. I didn't either. And they were just, they really just wanted me to hang out. But yeah. I was like, I'm like, I'm not getting a tattoo. And so I physically had to pull away from these dudes as they're like surrounding me, jump in my RV and like peel out. And I'm like in the rear view mirror, there's like dust in the air. And they're like, I thought they were going to chase me. I thought they were going to get on their bikes and fucking yeah. chase me because I disrespected them. And I was just trying to be cool. But like, I was like, oh my God, like get me the fuck out of here. It's like an episode of the Twilight Zone. Oh my so God. I almost got kidnapped by a biker gang. And that was just one. I, I mean... Next time I'll tell you some other war stories because there's some fucking amazing stories on the road. But that was like a recent one. I got like borderline. They were physically grabbing me. Like I had to pull off of the dude. It was sketchy, but nothing happened. That's yeah. yeah that's yeah. creepy. It I could mean, could have been worse. You probably get that. Like, is that is that happen every time you go somewhere? People are trying to make you fucking hang out with them. Maybe not that aggressive, uh-huh. but yeah, they want to hang out. You know, and that's a weird. And thing you want to be a dick, probably right. You can't. I win mean, that I one. would, but you. But it's like you can't win that one. You're gonna. You're gonna. You're either a dick. Like, there's if you hang out with them, you'll lose. And if you uh, say yeah. you can't, you'll lose. You're it's a lose lose. But uh, usually there's a way to get out of it. Here's the psychology, I think, of what it is, is that nowadays with, like, doing Instagram and, you know, shit nowadays where you're looking down the camera at people, they feel like they really know you. Mm -hmm. Because when I'm doing Instagram Mm -hmm. and I'm like, hey, guys, you're really talking directly to these people and they follow you and they DM you. So they feel like they're a part of your life. Do you respond to people? Sometimes I I do because I do this thing on my Instagram where I post the DMs that I get. So I like to feed the fire. So I'll, like, respond because I like to get them going. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, like, people hit me up and I respond to my fans because it could often lead to a funny text thread where I could post it. So I, I like to give them the bait, you know? So... Anyway, it's this weird thing where people feel like they they know you personally, and it's it's uh, you know, they want to hang out. They want to. It, it's it's a weird thing, and I ask for it by putting myself I'm, all day. I'm posting on social media, so that's gonna happen. But yeah, when you go to these smaller towns, it gets a little creepy sometimes. Never quite dangerous, like that might have been it. Um, usually, it's pretty chill, and you can get out of it. But yeah, it gets it gets to the point where it could be a little scary. There's one guy I remember had a gun. He came, he was like a military guy who just got out of the war and he was like sh- loading his gun and showing it to me and like, pl- and I was like, this is the motherfucker that'll kill you. This is the guy that's going to like, when you say, no, I can't yeah. hang out. And he was like, can I come to your hotel room and take a nap? And what? I was like, and I, yeah, he said that he was like a military guy with a gun, holding a gun saying, can I take a nap in your hotel in Texas? And I was like, oh man, look, I just got to go. Sorry, man. And he's like, oh, I see how it is. Like that kind of shit. And you're like, dude, Ugh. it gets fucking weird. I just got the chills. Especially our fans. We bring out kind of the kooky fucking yeah. weird. Yeah. Weirdos in a good way. I love weirdos, but like we bring out sort of the trip, you know. So they come out. So you just got to be a little careful. You know? Yeah. Is <laughs> you there know, anything you, know. uh, you want to do in the future that you haven't done yet? Um, Something un- you want to yeah, freelance gynecology work on? <laughs> and bask- underwater basket weaving? No, <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, like we were talking about in the beginning, like. I have no idea what's going to present itself next. I could kind of see myself maybe getting on the other side and doing more writing and producing and mm-hmm. casting even. Like, I'm always finding, like, talent, like, riffraff. I yeah. found when no one's fucking with them. Or, like, Mickey Avalon. Like, I tend to find these people that are diamonds yeah. in the rough and help them get out there. So, I don't know, a talent agency one day. Who fucking knows? I, you know what I was thinking, too, might be fun is, like, to teach like an improv class on the like I live in Venice now or to like do something kind of more interactive and fun because just going to that UCB class I'm like this is what it's all about mm-hmm. it's just about doing the shit like it doesn't have to be on camera on Instagram on TV like I just like doing the work you know yeah so maybe you're very good at being yourself yeah thank what you. about like uh, any advice for people on like how you get comfortable being yourself. You said that very quickly with MTV. You got very comfortable just interviewing yeah. people. Like any... You know, I, the advice is always a tricky thing because I always say, yeah. like, I wouldn't recommend to my worst enemy, like, come to L.A. and make it, mm-hmm. you know? But at the same time, I don't want to be a dream killer like I did. Um, I think, like, you just said it. Like, if you just be yourself and you're mm-hmm. able to be yourself, um, you'll win as long as, you know... You just got to be in the right place at the right time. And honestly, you got to know. One mm-hmm. thing I learned is you got to know people. Like yeah. knowing people's everything. Like that's what I got at MTV was I met everybody. Mm. And then therefore, when I came to LA, it was that much easier because, mm-hmm. oh, that's the, you know, we met. You just know people. Yeah, so yeah. knowing people is a really big thing for sure. 
So I guess go meet people and be yourself would be my advice. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you cool. so much yeah, for course. coming no, on. And then where can people find you on social media, oh, yeah. tour dates, anything like that coming up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. When is this going up? Uh, Soon? When's next month? Oh, okay, cool. So, yeah, let's see. I got some shows coming up in uh, Northern California. Um, uh, for Halloween, I have a couple shows in Northern California and Salt Lake City. And then I'm doing a November, I'm doing a run in, um, oh, I'm doing a run in uh, Texas, um, and I'm doing an Australia tour with some other in March with some shows sprinkled in. So you can find everything if you want to come to a live show at um, DirtNastyMusic.com or at SimonRex415 on Instagram. Or Twitter's at Simon Rex. Is Whatever, it, you'll find me. Is it mostly you or you and Mickey Avalon? It depends on. Mostly me and Mickey Avalon. Okay. And some I do alone and some he does alone. But mostly it's us. That's pe- the show people want to see is like, you know. Yeah. Is he still us. like a big partier? No, he's actually, he was. And yeah. we didn't talk for five years because he was such a big partier. Yeah. And I party too, but not as, he was like right, full on gnarly. Right. Like, and he talks about it in his music, like motherfucker was shooting up and smoking crack. Yeah, like, he was yeah. fucking gnarly. And I couldn't be around it. And after it got to a point where I'm like, I just can't be around the party anymore. And we had a falling out over some misunderstanding and money. Like the same old story of every band you hear about. Uh This fucking shit goes wrong. You know, fucking trust. when When you live in a van and hotels with somebody for a few years, you want to kill them after a while. Totally. So we had our differences. We didn't talk for like four years. And we recently kissed and made up. And now we are doing shows again together. And he's... Off the hard shit. Nice. He's not like sober sober, but mm-hmm. he's off of like hard shit. So he's back to being a normal human being. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Three Loco, I don't think we, 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 we don't have any shows on the books, but Riff Raff's still doing his thing. We, you know, if this pilot ends up happening, I'm sure that would generate like more shit for us. But uh, yeah, Three Loco for these who don't know, it's Riff Raff, me and Andy Malinakis. <clears throat> and yeah, what else? We stretching it out? Is that what? Oh no! Uh, oh. She was telling me I think the chip or the time, oh, whatever. Okay. okay. But um. Yeah. I think. What yeah. Else? What about you? Um. What about me? Was there anything to talk about for you? Not really. You know, just got married. Uh, yeah, just doing stand up yeah. podcast. Good. Good. You know, it's funny. It's like whenever people are like, "How are you? Like, what's going on with you?" I've never just been the kind of person to just like. You know, spill the beans about it. Talk about it. Yeah, it's just you know. I, know, I don't I know what it. that is. I don't know if I should be. It, it, it's no, just I like, get it. Same old, same old. Yeah, I get it. And then um, I'm, you know, well, I'm not nowadays gonna... with social media, it's like we see what you do every day. <laughs> you know what no I, more mystery. It's yeah. like, you know what I mean? When you're like, what you been up to? You're like, oh yeah, I saw it on Instagram. It's like, oh yeah. There's no more like, what have you been up to? It's like everyone knows everyone's business. Yeah, I'm not the one to like just start like telling a paragraph of right. everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. No, that's why it's different. Like being in this position as the mm-hmm. guest, you are talking about yourself, but I know what you mean. Like I'd rather just not talk about anything because uh-huh. half the time nothing happens anyway. Like this pilot on TBS I'm talking about. People are right. like, what's going on? Well, it may not even happen. So why? talk about it you know what I mean so much in this field is so much talk and not action that it gets annoying to talk about it all the time yeah you know what I mean yeah I know exactly what you're talking about I like yeah I'm the kind of person like if some you know something good's coming up it's like you'll see it yeah and then then I'll tell you after but like right now I'm not gonna tell you about the pilot I've been writing you know what I mean exactly yeah um so you're writing that's good yeah yeah yeah, you should be. I'm. Yeah, I'm. I'm always writing during the day and then at night doing stand up and. You Does know. your husband write with you? you? Guys write together. Um. Well, he he uh is in the process of trying to sell his own show right oh, now. Cool. Okay. Um, and is in all of those steps with that. Right. Uh. So, and then we want to also write a show together because everyone always says that you know. You know, that's you guys a, can let have me a ask show one together. thing. That's uh-huh. an interesting dynamic is having a guy girl writing combination uh-huh. that's actually like that loves each other and is a, uh-huh. and makes love to one another and writes comedy together because me and my girl recently have been sort of going to UCB classes mm-hmm. together and shooting little sketches together. I'm like, well, I've never ever in my life had like a girl that I'm dating mm-hmm. that's funny that I would want to do this with because normally I keep those so separate. Mm-hmm. I would never dare like you work where I sleep or vice versa. You know what I mean? Totally. Or, so how is that is that challenging or is that like normal? No, it's or does it fun. feel natural? Right? It's fun. I feel like we have really good chemistry together. Dude, you know, we make like little dumb videos together. I see you guys. It's funny. I and see what it, you guys do. It's and really there's funny. so much fun and people are always 
telling us that they want, you know, when are you guys going to, you know, try to make a show together? So we have an idea that, you know. About you guys being a couple within the show or something yeah, you write for some, we're a yeah. couple um, who, like, uh, who, like, inherits a rehab or something. Oh, that's funny. Uh, yeah, I'm, because you guys are, see, chemistry is everything, and that's the thing. Like, that's why, um, like, Typical Rick, the show that you yeah. were with me and Nick. Me and Nick have been friends for a, a, about 20 Swartzen. years. Yes, Nick Swartzen. So when it came time to, like, shoot... It wasn't like, oh, actor A, meet actor B. You guys are best uh-huh. friends for 15 years. Go. It's like, no, we really have chemistry because we yeah. were friends. So we know how to talk with each other. So I'd imagine that that Yeah, helps. just volley because, off each other you know I mean? and, it's, and it's super fun. You have the fun. rhythm down. Yeah, we're almost just like, you know, we can just improv off each other and make like really fun. Like when we just went on our honeymoon to Italy and... Um, we were we just set up a camera and we we're like let's make a video and we ended up making this whole like first date video and like put it together like a little short film, but we just set up the camera and just uh, just started and like became these like weird characters and right. it was so fucking funny right. and it was like we could just make something out of nothing. That's the magic, man. That's yeah. what it's all about. That's yeah. fun. See, that's fun and it's weird because I'm used to just doing that with my boys and like. You know, yeah. not doing that with my girl, and it's the first time in my life I've had a chick that I can like do comedy stuff with, or or I actually trust her. Like I'll be sitting there, I'm like, "Do you think this is funny?" And if she doesn't laugh, I trust her. Mm. And I'm like, "Oh, if you didn't laugh, then and and I agree, it's not funny." I'm not used to having that in a partner. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. So it's actually you uh, should try to shoot something together. Uh, well, we have been we've been shooting little stuff for fun, and like we just shoot like obviously just very casual, like not scripted things for fun and. And, uh, and if it's working, then yeah, that's... Yeah, it's like, but it's chemistry. That's what mm-hmm, anything is. Mm-hmm. And if it's just natural and it's not forced, it's like I was saying before, don't try. Like, if it just comes off natural, you you win all day long. But I've never uh, had a partner in crime that I can do comedy with. It's pretty rad. I love it. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to see what happens for you guys. It's like Woody Allen with all the girls, like Diane Keaton or whatever back in the day. Like, mm-hmm. he would do comedy with his girls. I get. I mean, right? Does that make sense? Or, like, who else does that? Yeah, like, what Mia Farrow. Com- he was, yeah, right. exactly. Um, what do you do to stay in shape? I do hot yoga. I do basketball. I do, um, boxing. How often do you work out? You have always been so lean, incredible shape. Oh, thanks. Uh, geez. I just, uh, I think it's just honestly like just genetics. Do you eat healthy? Yeah, I do eat pretty healthy, but I just ate Chick-fil-A on the way here. Uh And I fucking like, it's not like I'm some weird, like super V, like I, the thing is in LA, we have such good food at our disposal that I usually eat pretty good, Yeah, but I'm not, it's not like Air One. Yeah, Air One. So expensive. So expensive. So fun. Um, So much fun. It's the best. Like you could take my extra $4 for whatever the fuck because it's that much better. But I think I just, um, uh, I think it's just like, I, I'm just a skinny dude. Like I can't mm-hmm. gain weight. Like I'll work out and try to get big and I just can't. So I think I'm just, lu- I guess if you want to be skinny, that's then I'm lucky, but I can't gain weight or get buff if I wanted to. But yeah, I do like hot yoga, basketball. I do, uh, uh, what else? I've been doing boxing lately, which is super you, humbling. Have you been to Rumble? No, what's that? Oh, I don't know. It's some the like trendy has? kind of boxing. Oh no, I do. I, my buddy has like a, a private coach, and I go with him. Ooh. And then uh, I do. Um, I do this thing called Circuit Works, which is fucking gnarly. Circuit Works is basically this crazy one-hour workout where you do like treadmill, bench press, treadmill, squats, yeah. treadmill. It's like an intense one-hour crash fucking course. Um, and on that note, uh, I'm the LA douchebag talking about his workout routine. So let's stop now. I love it. Thank you yeah. so much Thank for coming you for on. Me, Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.